I can start. Yes. So good afternoon. So today I will be telling in the context of the HSCT uh, regarding uh, briefly about HLA typing and ABO incompatibility management in our uh, stem cell uh, transplantation. So as we know that the HLA is a very big and vast topic. So mainly the role of HLA comes in the in depth, if you want to go, it comes mainly role in the unrelated uh, because as the stem cell transplantation process has evolved previously, earlier they used to do only uh, matched uh, sibling. Uh, then it gradually evolved from the matched sibling into the matched related donors. Then they went to the unrelated donor, then haploidentical system. So the as the evolution of the transplant has uh, evolved, so the main role of the HLA came into the picture. So because the HLA system is mainly uh, responsible for the immune uh, uh, reconstitution between the donor and uh, the recipient, uh, either it be the through the rejection or the uh, uh, GVHD, all those, the HLA plays very important role. The We will be just focusing on the what is basics of the HLA and what need to be uh, done for in our context of the hemo, mainly hemoglobinopathies HSC settings. So I will not be going in detail about the malignancy settings. So you know that the basically the stem cell transplantation between uh, it is between the genetically different individuals became possible when the HLA system at the MHC complex, that is major histocompatibility complex was identified. So that different types of stem cell transplantation as the uh, it uh, occurs, whether it is a bone marrow source or PBSC are in the umbilical cord. So the basic principle is same only in the stem cell transplantation. The source might be different. But the basic principle of the stem cell transplantation is same. It is the type of one of the gene therapy. So the, this MHC complex is mainly located on the short arm of the chromosome 6. So which is highly polymorphic and it encodes the cell surface molecules which, are, which present the antigen peptides to the T cell receptors. So that is the mainly the location of the HLA. So you can see this... Uh, uh, chromosome 6. So usually we know that our chromosomes will have one long arm and one short arm. The major histocompatibility complex is mainly located in the this short arm of the chromosome 6. So this is the HLA region. So basically the HLA can be divided into two classes. The MHC complex of the HLA is divided into two classes. That is class 1 which is further divided into A, B, C and class 2 DP, DQ and TR. So these are the major uh, classifications. So the usually I think you will be aware that the class one is present, the class one HLA is present on almost all nucleated cells and also platelets. Whereas the class two HLA is mainly present on the antigen presenting cells only. So that is mainly B cells, dendritic cells and uh, uh, the uh, other lymphocytes, all those. So these antigen uh, presenting cells uh, will have class two, whereas class one is present on all nucleated and also platelets also. So this was I was telling. So HLA class 1 molecules are expressed on the all healthy nucleated cells and also platelet nails, whereas class 2 proteins are mainly expressed on the antigen presenting cells, that is B cells, macrophages and dendritic cells. So as I told that HLA classification is a polymorphism, highly variable between the different individuals. So even if the in the in within the family, this HLA will be highly variable. Specifically, if you go in deep into this class 1 and class 2, the DR molecule is the highly variable uh, HLA uh, antigen. So DR antigen is the high, highest variable. We have so many variables in the DR, specifically the DRB1. So that is. So these are the class 1 and class 2 molecules. So the structure, uh, this is the class 1 and uh, class 2. So the class 1 molecule mainly has a uh, alpha and beta 2 microglobulin, whereas a class 2 molecule is a dimer of the alpha and beta. So the this is the antigen binding uh, site. So the HLS main uh, function is they will present these antigens to the T cells, the effector T cells, whether the, from the uh, donor to recipient or from the recipient to the donor. So this is the in class 1 mal Class 1, it is a closed-end peptide binding cleft, whereas in a class 2 molecule, this is open-ended peptide uh, binding cleft. And it has a, a transmembrane tile also, it, uh, whereas class 2 molecules has two transmembrane tiles, whereas class 1 has only one uh, transmembrane tile. So, as we know that it, uh, coming to the HLA inheritance, so because we will uh, mass, uh, we will do the, all we know that all our chromosomes will have two chromatids. Each chromosome will have two chromatids in our body. 
so when the inheritance is there from one one comes from the father one comes from the mother so we will uh, the, these two one chromatid completely inherited from the uh, one haplo from the father one from the mother so as you see here uh, these are the one chromatid from the one chromosome and the one from the mother so there are four different uh, permutation and combinations can get in the offsprings so usually the, when the, uh, when the regions where there is no consanguinity is there so usually there is very rare occurrence of the full match settings because we know that the inheritance of the haplotypes is from one from father and one one mother if they they don't share the uh, this hls so it is very unlikely that the uh, siblings will have the full match and uh, it will be uh, uh, from the father to uh, uh, siblings so usually these father uh, parents to siblings they will not have any full uh, sharing of the hla component whereas in Indian subcontinent and other also some uh, regions where there is the prevalence of the consanguinity is there almost like 10 to 15 percent, especially in some parts of the India. So where there both and mother, mother and father can share the same uh, HLA uh, haplotypes so that there is chances that at least 10 to 15 percent of our uh, the people will have uh, the fully matched haplotypes in the HLA. So that is mainly because of the consanguinity history. So they share from the both the father and mother will say share the same HLA haplotypes so that the siblings will have also share either the similar to the parents or to the siblings. So they will share uh, same haplo HLA haplotypes and it will they we will find more uh, 10 to 15 percent of the matched uh, uh, HLA inheritance. So this is the HLA inheritance. So then coming to the typing. So this is important. So what are the typing methods of the HLA? So there are classes, uh, the majority, it's mainly the earlier it was serologic assays, then cellular, that is a micro lymphocytotoxicity test they used to do, then mixed lymphocyte culture, that is cellular assays, but the later evolution, it has come to the molecular assays mainly. So the I think these, these uh, serologic and cellular as, uh, assays are now obstacle. So nobody is doing because they don't have significant contribution to the, the GV, uh, the, in the association with the GVHD, they can't predict. So the, the most of the HLA typing all over the world is they are doing with the molecular assays. The two mainly DNA based methods, sorry, uh, DNA based methods that is uh, sequence based testing is the most common and uh, in our uh, uh, unit and we also are following this same sequence based testing is the method we are following in the uh, detection of the HLA. So there are others also sequence specific primary detection, sequence specific oligonucleated probe and uh, the sequence based testing but most of the dna based tests are sequence based testing which are uh, this is also called high resolution uh, uh, hla matching so these two are now almost uh, still nobody is uh, doing this uh, serologic or cellular assays of the hla typings so this was the different types so i was telling so serology methods so usually previously the serology method they used to identify the hla protein on the cell surface using the antibody the anti sera they used to specifically whether they react. So based on that, they'll use to identify the HLA protein of the, uh, pay, uh, the whatever the patient or donor. So it used to be the mainly the low resolution. The All these serological methods used to be the low resolution. I will tell the how to nomenclature the HLA and how to differentiate whether it's a DNA based or not DNA based. So that is, so the DNA based I was telling those three that is a single specific oligonucleotide sequence based typing and high resolution so the sequence based typing and high resolution both are almost synonymous so these two are the high resolution so these are the uh, most the centers and all over the world now they are uh, doing the uh, hle so the, the specimen from where to take we know that we we will take we either we, we need dna so either we can take from the buccal mucosa or we can take from the our bloods so where the lymphocytes, all those, they will culture and they will extract the DNA and they will do the HLA typing in the high resolution. So usually the process in our unit, if you take, uh, usually what they say is standard criteria, we are sending one, one set of samples to the DKMS, where the mainly they will do uh, in the buccal, uh, buccal mucosa. So the sampling is also very simple method. So it's already pre, uh, the pre-labeled kits will be there. So the, each uh, each uh, patient and the family will be uh, given the specific number. And uh, as you see in this picture, you they, they, depending on the relations, uh, the mother or sibling one, sibling two, father, all those will be pre-labeled and they will generate the barcode and the samples will be there. 
those sticks we have to take and we have to the the procedure you can see in the some uh, internet also you will see how to take the hla from the buccal mucosa only thing the precautions we will take is if there are some chewing all those there we will tell them to wash the mouth properly so that the contamination will not be there so then we have to rotate uh, multiple times the buccal mucosa so that the um, uh, adequate tissue is obtained so that will be preserved and uh, it is stored and it is sent to the dkms laboratory so we, they where they will uh, extract the dna and the type the hla and uh, the other uh, the usually the most of the centers and also european guidelines they say that once you have the standard on the hla you should also locally you should confirm the same hla with the, the that's called confirmatory hla so our unit will uh, as we do one initial hla with the dkms or local and we will do another set of hla with a different set of laboratory either locally if you have some labs we can do that uh, local labs also that is confirmatory hla because there is some uh, to avoid some errors so there will be some lab variations or errors might be there so you have to be uh, completely sure that these hlas are the uh, proper and it's fully matched or haplo whatever doing it is proper representative of the uh, both the uh, donor and recipient so then we have to uh, do the confirmatory hla also so the usually the advantage of the buccal mucosa rather than the blood is one advantage is that because we need the lymphocytes and the, for the culture for the DNA. For example, if the some patients are hemoglobin with this or take a plastic anemia or Franconia anemias, they might be getting repeated blood transfusions. So if they have recently blood transfusions, that might, that might be the uh, contamination from the other uh, do donor uh, the blood, uh, this one. So there might be some contamination. Whereas that can be avoided in the uh, buccal mucosal DNA. And there are some instances that the very severe pancytopenia, they might not get cellularity in the blood also. They might not get the DNA all those. So that is one of the advantage of the taking in buccal mucosa. So we, uh, buccal mucosal, uh, the sample can be taken at any time. So there is no uh, uh, less chances of the contamination if they even they have received any transfusions all those. So that's the one of the advantage. So we can uh, usually, uh, otherwise, uh, we can take either from the blood and also from the buccal mucosa. So then coming to the HLA nomenclature. So we would have seen the HLA, uh, uh, the nomenclature. So usually we have one uh, genotyping. That is, we know that the HLA has class 1 and class 2. That is this genotyping. A, B, C are the class 1 molecules. DR, DQ and DP is the class 2 molecules. Then there is a separator. So this the asterisk mainly implies that this is done from the DNA base. So if you see this asterisk, the, the method of the uh, HLA typing is DNA based uh, HLA. So that is the uh, asterisk. Then comes to the first allele group. So usually in the uh, low resolution, only this allele group will be there. So this is a HLA antigen group, LA, first two letters. In, whereas in high resolution, we will the, this allele group is followed by the four letters or five letters. This will be the complete high resolution. So this will be the separator and the two variables will be there. So it, it will be the HLA specific protein, so which will be in the high resolution. Whereas in earlier, we used to do low resolution also. So low, low resolution will not show these four uh, allele subtypes. It will show only this until this antigen uh, type. So this is the nomenclature and there are some extended. So you as the unrelated match donor has evolved. So the HLA, they have given some uh, extended uh, grouping, extended numbering also. So uh, right now for our unit or for basic, we need not go into deep into the, this last uh, two digits because if we have multiple donors with the high resolution match, then we might take consideration into the, these last two uh, non-coding regions. So otherwise there is no, not much importance of these non-coding regions of the last two. So as high resolution is there, so at, at least after this antigen four allele uh, labeling should be there. So that is uh, compulsory should be there in the high resolution. So that is important. I will be further uh, uh, showing the results of the various studies where they had initially compared with the uh, only low resolution with the high resolution and the impact previously they thought that it was a full match in the low resolution but when they typed into the high resolution these were entirely different from the donor and recipient so there was no miss uh, there was no complete match and they had transplant related mortality and more rejections are gvhd so this is the nomenclature so main important is this is a gene type that whether it is a class one and class two, the asterisk determines the method of the, the DNA extraction. That is method of the HLA typing. That is DNA method. That is the, this one. And the first uh, antigen typing. This is the low resolution. And the next four uh, letters are the mainly high resolution typing.
So this is the nomenclature. So as I was telling, the low resolution is also called generic typing or two digit typing it was. So the mainly it used to correspond to the identification of the broad families of the alleles that cluster into zero types. That is first two letters only. Then high resolution it has came into a four digit typing. So it allows the discrimination of the individual alleles within the each zero type. So because the all zero types may be different two only, but in, in this zero type, there are further classification of the alleles. So which play important role in the uh, immune reconstitution, whether there is complete match or not match. So that is, that's why now almost all every, uh, everywhere we will follow high resolution for HLA typing, even uh, low resolution, they might have high resolution mismatch also. So that is the high resolution, low resolution. So same thing, the low resolution is the antigen level that is two uh, will be there. Whereas high, high resolution is the allele level matching that is four or the four numbers will be matched. So then coming to the HLA matching and mismatching details. So as we know that earlier we used to do low resolution typing. So mainly they used to consider mainly three important. So in the class one, A and B, and then come in class two drb1 they used to consider so the low resolution they used to do by six by six then gradually evolved into eight by eight then ten by ten now almost high resolution the most of the centers will do to 12 by 12 that is all the three class two that is drb1 dqb1 dpb1 and class one abc so that is 12 by 12 but you still now also european uh, blood and bone marrow transplantation guidelines they will take at least 10 by 10 for the high resolution we have to see uh, because I will be telling further, there is something called a permissive and non-permissive DPB1 mismatch also. So if some DPB1 mismatches, if, if permissive, we can consider into it as a full matches also. So that is, these are the mainly the pre earlier we used to sell low resolution 6 by 6, that is full match. Then 8 by 8 also. So standard, we are telling at least 10 by 10 or 12 by 12. Now we are doing with the high resolution and DNA based methods, we are con considering these matches. So that was the influence of the high resolution. See, there are many articles previous. That's what I was telling. The low resolution only antigen level, they used to be mainly matches with the uh, antigen level, but allele uh, ma matches we used to not to do. But the, after later, the, as the, the technique has evolved and the, they compared with the transplant related outcomes. So then they had told that even HLA DRB on single high resolution mismatches negatively affects the transplant outcome. So that is the importance of the high resolution. So within the antigen also, if the allele mismatch is there, then it negatively affects the transplant outcome. In HLA, A, B, C, single antigen serological defined mismatch transplants negatively affects the transplant outcome. And even A, B, C, single high resolution DNA defined mismatch did not affect the transplant outcome. So mainly what they told is the high resolution, if they don't have any mismatch, so the high resolution allele mismatch is not there. The transplant outcome was better. Whereas if they done uh, antigen match was there, but high resolution mismatch was there. There was a drastic red uh, in the transplant outcome. Either, either it is to GVHD or uh, graft rejection. There were more transplant related, uh, less in the negative effect of the transplant outcome. Then coming to the DPB1 mismatch. So what we are doing, this DPV1 mismatch mainly comes into context of the one, uh, uh, almost if you have found the 10 by 10 match or if you have to a 12 by 12, where some sometimes there will be DPV1 mismatch might be there. But they came to know that they divided the DPV1 into the three groups. That is based on the T cell ep epitope, they will tell. That is the three groups, group one, group two, group three. Because what they found is this is the common analysis. If it, the DPB1 might be different, but these common analysis, they are segregated to the common group. So if, for example, if they have the same epitopes, even the different alleles between the donor and the recipient, but if the epitope comes into the same group, then it is called permissive DPB1 mismatch. So for example, if someone has DPB, uh, DPB1 91, the donor, whereas the recipient had uh, DPB1 101. So they made algorithm if they have this uh, epi common epitopes, whether it is a permissive or non-permissive. If the permissive mismatch is there, we can consider it as, it is as a full match only. So there is no uh, negative effect to the transplant related outcome. Whereas if they were non-permissive uh, group, then there is uh, related to the whether it is a H HVG uh, direction or GVS direction. I will be later, I will be telling what is these directions, post versus graft uh, direction or graft versus post direction 
So we need not remember these uh, alleles which are permissive and non-permissive. There is standard algorithms will be there. So this was the paper. This is the one of the algorithm. So mainly they divide into group one, group two, and group three. So in group they will uh, they will see the donor uh, epitope and the recipient epitope. So that's what here. See if, if it is the between donor and uh, recipient one one or one two one three based on that if it, these are falls into these epitopes, this is called permissive or 2, 2, 2, 3 and 2, 2, 2, 3, it is also permissive. Whereas if they coincide with the two, sorry, coincide with the two, uh, the epitope group of the 2, 2 or 2, 3, 2, 3 versus 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, then it will be non-permissive. So you understood, no? So because the here, the y-axis is donors epitopes. So we have two, each HLA has two, you know, DPB1, each has two chromatids. So this is whether it falls into the epitope 1, epitope 2, epitope 1, epitope 2, like that they have divided. And in recipients also similar, they have divided. If they are matching into this algorithm, this is permissive. So they, we can take it, consider it as a full match. Whereas if they are not falling into the non-permissive group, then uh, these are all not fully matched. But in some conditions, for example, if you see this group, non-permissive GVH, if you have malignant diseases, where you, you want some GVL effect, you want some graft versus host effect. You have 10 by 10 match and you have a non-permissive uh, DPV1 match. So if you select, there is some advantage that they might have, they might produce more GVL effect than the, the malignancy can be cured. So that advantage can be there in the non-permissive match. Whereas if you take same into the hemoglobinopathies or non-malignant, there is more chances of the getting GVHD. So that based on the disease, we have to consider whether we can consider the, uh, the permissive or non-permissive matches in the, uh, during the consideration of the DPB1 mismatch. So that is the importance of the DPB1 mismatch. So you got or any doubts here there in DPB1 mismatch? It's, it's clear. Yeah. So, but you need not remember all these alleles or nothing, you know, so it's mainly algorithm based, even when the HLA report comes, they will only, based on the algorithm, they will give whether it's a permissive or non-permissive DPB1 mismatch, based on that your patient uh, condition and uh, what is the disease type, all those we can consider whether to choose the donor or not, if the permissive mismatch is there, non-permissive, that we can consider. So that is the uh, DPB1 mismatch. So. The, this was I was telling on a simple practical basis mismatches among the low expression of the DPB1 alleles should be prioritized over mismatches among high expression HLA B1 alleles. So be, this based on their expression they had immuno, immunologicity they were given high immunogenicity uh, less immunogenicity and lowest so that is so if they are in because these alleles will have the, the TCE group 3 they are very less immunogenic. So the less the immunogenic, the more the tolerability in the mismatch between the donor and recipient. So that's why here you, they are given. If the more the if the more, if falls into the third group, they are more permissive. More than the fifty percent falling into the third group are permissive. These alleles which are falling. So that's why they have divided from the high immunogenicity to the low immunogenicity. The group one, group two, group three. So the more uh, more in the group they are permissive. So according to that, we have uh, they have divided into that algorithm they have made. So in case that HLA DPV1 incompatibilities are present, patient will be tested for the uh, if if non-permissive or incompatibilities are there, we have to do donor specific antibodies, which I will be telling later regarding small uh, uh, one or two words about the uh, and donor specific antibodies. So why this is important? See if you see if you, the the they have in CIBMPR they had compared the outcomes of the uh, transplant related mortality, they compared with the HLA DPB1 match and permissive match and non permissive match. So, if you see the blue line, that is non permissive HLA DPB1 mis uh, that is mismatch. The transplant related uh, non relapse mortality was high if you compare to the DPB1 match. Whereas, if you see that uh, permissive mismatch, if you see that blue line, there is a significant difference in the mortality rate. So if the if you choose the permissive HLA DPB1 mismatch also uh, compared to the non-permissive mismatch, the transplant related mortality is very less. So based on that, they have uh, calculated the algorithm and uh, they have given. If you don't, this is in the context. If you don't find fully DPB1 match, 
if you have two donors one is completely dpb on match one is dpb on permissive match there you can choose dpb on match only rather than permissive if you don't have multiple donors with the only dpb on mismatch is there there we have to see whether permissive or non permissive those with the permissive hla dpb on mismatch we can choose so that the transplant related mortality will be lesser so that's the advantage of this uh, that is the logic behind the permissive and non permissive dpb on mismatch and for DRB1, you don't have this. Yeah, that's right. No, only this permissive mismatch is applicable only for the DPB1. So all others, HLA, B, C, DQ, and DR, all should be the completely match. No, I saw in the previous statement, you have said, I think the slide before, yeah, that uh, people have shown that if you have a mismatch of DRB1. Yeah, it negatively affects. That's right. It should be matched. So this context is mainly A, B, C, D, R, B, on D, Q, B, on. We should have complete match. There is nothing like permissive and non-permissive. The permissive, non-permissive comes only in the context of the D, P, B, one only. So if D, R, B, one, if higher resolution mismatch is there between, then it negatively affects the transplant-related outcome. There is nothing like trans uh, permissive and non-permissive in that. Even if A, B, and C are matching, but D, R, B, one is mismatch, then it will negatively affect the transplant outcome. Yeah. So there was some uh, studies they have done which loci are important because we we know that we do different types of transplants bone marrow PBSC or uh, haplo related unrelated. So they had some consensus that in some types the if you do sibling marrow which are the very important. So as we are telling previously see only sibling bone marrow transplant used to be done. So they used to consider low resolution also. So they had told that in the sibling bone marrow, uh, bone marrow as the source, only main important thing are HLA, A, B, and uh, DRB1. So that is five by uh, six by six match. At least this is the, at least it should be there because some centers they might not. Some centers if they don't have any uh, technique to do high resolution, they do low resolution. So they they used to do only six by six matches. They they will not do HLA C or HLA DQB1 or DPB1. So if you are considering for the sibling match, this, that is okay. Even six by six matching, this should be the minimal required criteria. So HLA, A, B, and DRB1 are the minimal for the bone marrow if the sibling you are doing. Whereas in unrelated bone marrow, unrelated uh, transplants, even the bone marrow source, you have to take consideration into the HLA C also, HLA DQB1 also. So the minimal criteria should be 10 by 10, not six by six. If if you have fully related, only for the family related, that is sibling only, we have to consider six by six. If you have unrelated, you have to type extended type and minimal is 10 by 10. You have to do uh, all for the, at least for the uh, DRB on DQB on also. Haplo, same thing to the haplo also. You have to type for the A, B, C, DRB on and DQB on also. You should not do only low resolution like uh, sibling bone marrow that uh, HLA, A, B and DQB, DRB one, if the match is there and uh, unrelated also and are also haplo also for all this haplotype is shared or not we have to see so if i have a sibling and if i have a sibling yeah don't yeah but i have a six out of two so, but no not six of total you have to six of six only no i think if i do a high resolution yeah and i have a sibling but in my high resolution a b uh, DRB DRB one. one. Oh, okay. yeah and so it will be like six zeros six by six so, yeah yeah, those ones, the rest are not matching. Rest are not matching means if you have already, you have the chance to do. That's what I'm telling. If you have chance to do, then you have to take into the 12 by 12 consideration. That's what, if you have a high resolution typing, yeah. sibling, if you have matched only for HLA, B and DRB1, if others are not matched, you should not consider as a fully matched. If you don't have the chance, because the most... The, the most of the siblings and related, if they are matched for HLA, B and DRB1, it will be matched for C and DQB1 also. There might be some exceptions. So when they, there is no chance that you have high resolution typing, you have only low resolution. Then you, you can consider six by six if you are giving as a sibling with the bone marrow. But if you have opportunity to do high resolution typing, you have to give importance to the only high resolution. So high resolution complete typing should be there. So these are minimum criteria which are all important. Minimum. If you don't have chance to type for C and DQB1, if you don't have any chance, then at least these should be fulfilled. So that is the criteria. So I will tell that guidelines in uh, one or two slides. So that is important. So this was I was telling about. So basically, 
I didn't go deep about the alleles all those. So basic typing, what uh, what is the HLA? I have told how to identify which is the antigen, which is allele. So low difference between the low resolution HLA and high resolution HLA, how to identify and identify the how which what method is the HLA has been done. So usually the most of the 90 to 95 percent we are doing with the DNA based method only. That asterisk will be there that I had told and I had told about the DHLA DPV1 match and permissive and non permissive. So until now, any doubts are there because I will be telling now in the more context of the haplo rather than sibling. So once the, your fully match is there, there is no uh, GVH direction or uh, HVG direction. There is no point of the DSA, all those, if it is fully match. These, all these uh, DSA and the GVH direction, HVG direction all comes in the haplo identical transplants. Fully match, it will not come. So until now, if you have any uh, doubts, you can uh, ask questions. Okay, so just I will tell about the what is in the context of this haplo and uh, haplo identical. I will tell about the GVH and HVG direction. So what happens is, is many of the HLS uh, typing we would have seen if uh, either recipient or donor express as a single HLA allele at a locus that is homozygous. Both HLA A will be same numbers. Both, both two, each we know that each HLA has a two numbers. Two, two prominent. HLA A has two numbers and HLA B has two C like the similar. If one of the single allele has a homozygous, that is A, it has same numbers, or B it has the same numbers, or C it has the same numbers. That is unidirectional match will occur. Either it can be two types. Either donor can have similar same type or recipient can have same type. If the recipient is homozygous at specific locus, including the presence of null allele, the donor is heterozygous. For example, if the uh, patient is homozygous, donor is uh, heterozygous. That is called host to graft vector. Means host might produce more immune response against the donor. So there, the more chances of the graft rejection can be there. Okay. If the donor has a homozygous at the specific HLA, uh, recipient is heterozygous. That is called graft to versus host direction so it is it implies that there is more chances of the gvhd so this is the one if, when we play this role is one is type for example if you have uh, uh, hemoglobin benign disorders where you don't want gvl effect you want uh, gvhd pre this one so if you have multiple haplo identical donors if you, you two two three donors will be there there if someone is completely home donor is completely homozygous there is more chances that gvl effect will be there we can avoid those if you have another haplo identical donor so i will tell the steps which is the first in the selection of the i think one another topic is that donor selection is completely different topic where what matters whether hla then comes the uh, C, uh, because uh, C, hla cmv blood grouping uh, all these will be consideration in the donor selection so there is step this is a donor selection is a stepwise process so usually hla press the first step in the donor selection irrespective of after, uh, next hla is the important so in that hla if we have multiple patients like uh, haplotypes if you have someone a homozygous the donor if you have another haplotype who is not a homozygous if you want to gvl effect you avoid we can choose another whereas in malignant diseases this is advantage if we have donor with the complete homozygous, if malignant disease is there, we want more GVL effect, then we can choose that donor because we want more GVL effect. So that is the GVH versus HVG direction. Because if you open the BMT plus, if you see the patients, many patients, they, they will be written inferences. Class 1 HVG, class 2 GVH. So that is the inference. So that is who has the uh, uh, homozygosity, whether the donor has or patient has, depending on that, if the donor has the homozygous, it is GVH, simple. If the patient has a homo homozygosity, that is HVG direction. So that is the GVH and HVG direction. Okay. Yeah, in BMT plus I will just show. I think I, I don't I have not typed here. So in BMT plus we can open and we can uh, I can uh, quote how it is there. For example, if, for example, if you see HLA, A, B, I will take only HLA, A or B something. So one patient is there, one donor is there. So if patient has HLA-A, uh, you know the 2 slash 0, 1 slash 0, 1. And it's, uh, 2 will be there. So both will be same. 2 slash 0, 1 slash 0, 1, 2 0, 1, 0, 1. Whereas the donor has HLA-A, 2, 0, 1, 0, 1. HLA-A, another loci is 3, 1, 0, 2. 
so that is heterozygous he has whereas the recipient has homozygous same number so that is host versus graph direction so same applies if the same has donor as homozygous and uh, that is graph versus host direction so that is based on hla low psi so that then come to the small uh, just uh, about the dsa so hla donor specific antibodies in the hsct so usually the use of partially hla mismatched allogenic hsct has allowed the possibility of the presence of circulating hla donor specific antibodies in the recipient so we know that it is a partially matched so the hla is also antigen so we might if the patient has exposed to the similar hla you would have developed antibodies against the particular hla so that is called donor specific antibodies so these are the hla donor specific antibodies are the pre formed antibodies in the recipient directed against donors class 1 or class 2 hla antigens so that is the uh, definition of the donor specific antibodies these are already pre formed antibodies in the patient recipient against the donors class 1 or class 2 hla antigens so usually the presence of dss at the time of sterile cell infusion increases the risk of primary graft failure because these will fight against those hlas and it will destroy the stem cells so there is chances that primary graft failure is there so usually what happens is uh, this is see any presence of dsa against uh, unshared haplotype in the recipient was associated with more than tenfold increase of the engraftment failure so if you have more dsa more the chances of the uh, graft failure there were many studies so usually the dss uh, i had mentioned here so dss will be done in different types of methods i will be telling there is a flow cytometry method and there is a solid phase immunoassay methods the most commonly is done is the solid phase immunofluorescence uh, method where we will uh, the, give the values that is mf5 will tell mean fluorescent intensity uh, values so usually they have done different uh, studies where they told that anything more than previously they used to tell that anything more than 5000 there is more chances of the graft failure if the dsa value is more than uh, m uh, 5000 mf5 the more chances of graft rejection then further they told that even anything more than 2000 more than 2000 uh, mf5 of the dsa is also highest chance for the graft rejection also sometimes poor graft function also if they engraft also later poor graft function that is they might engraft the function will be graft function might will be poor so that's also your dsa will uh, cause poor graft fun function also so usually the rate of sensitization is 20 to 40 percent in haplocytic so even if you have haploidentical donors there is 20 to 40 percent chances that they will have dss patients might have dss they would have exposed to the similar haplotypes so that's why the important every haploidentical donor we have to do dss because we have to if the higher the dsa is there if uh, we have to choose the donor without dsa or in cases if both the do haplo identical donors both usually the haploidentical donors most of the time will be the mother and father sometimes the siblings also might be the haploidentical donors so if the one of the uh, dsa positive donor is there we have to try to avoid the dsa positive and we have to see for dsa negative if we don't find DSA negative donor, then we might have to do the desensitization procedure to reduce the DSAs. So this is the importance of the DSA. So usually uh, how the DSAs have, the, these are HLA antibodies already formed in the uh, patient. So how it uh, formed? HLA antibodies can form through multiple mechanisms. So that is mainly during pregnancy because the the children's HLA would have crossed the, and the mother in mother, the mother's HLA would have crossed into the baby. There, the baby would have produced the antibodies against the mother's HLA. That is during the pregnancy and repeated blood transfusion. We know that the, the HLA has so much polymorphism and diversity that if the, if the any hemoglobin with the patients would have received multiple transfusions. So those in the one of the transfusions, one of the, uh, the uh, HLAs can be shared between the donor and that uh, unknown uh, blood transfusions those hls the patient would have developed the antibodies when with those hls so their uh, antibodies would have produced or some cases prior organ transplants also in any solid organ transplants would have happened so there also against hla the antibodies would have, these are the major mechanisms but in the context of our hsct mainly the blood transfusions are the common source of sensitization for the undergoing hsct that's why we say the earlier the uh, age of the transplant for the hemoglobin is the better outcome because the more the you transfuse the more the sensitization they will get and the more the antibodies will be produced the more chances of the 
rejections also will be there, heavily transfused. Among the now, maybe you you put you've done your HDMI. Yeah. You you have haplo identical donor. Yeah. Siblings are all haplo identical. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, the 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 CPS has antibodies against all. To, to all of them. And, and then you decide to go for the sensitization. Yes. At what cut do you have a cut off an acceptable cut off? Yeah, that's what I was telling. So the cutoff is 2000. So the generalized cutoff we take is MF, that MFI values they give, mean fluorescent intensity values they will give. So usually less than 2000 is acceptable cutoff. Some centers they try for 1000 also. It depends on the guidelines which. So you usually European EBMT guidelines they have made that any MFI less than 2000 is acceptable. So anything more than 2000, if you don't find any less than 2000 haplo, then we might have to go for the desensitization procedure. So, and one more thing is important is see, not all these anti-HLA antibodies are directed against donor HLA antigens also. Sometimes what happens is the many, the MFA value will be high. If you do the specific, uh, we will do single bead antigen assays. So that is, they will, they will give the values. So in single bead antigen assay, what they will do is, each against each uh, HLA antigen, how much uh, antibodies are there, they will give in detail. So if you look in that details, there might not be any donors HLA will be uh, uh, shared here. So in that time, even if the HLA MFI is more, we can consider the, the donor as a for the haplo. You got it? Because the, the generalized antibody will be more value. So for example, some donors, uh, DSA we, against donor we have done, the DSA has come as a 2,500. So it's not in acceptable range, we don't, we know. Then we will do the single bead antigen. So that is against each antigen, uh, they will they will give the values of the antibodies against the each HLA ant uh, antigens. So in that, if you see and compare the donors HLA, we might not find those H HLA, donors HLA will implicated in this. It might be the antibodies against others antibodies complicated. Then we can consider that if it is not antibodies against the donor HLA, we can consider that donor without desensitization also. So that is yeah. more chances because she would have exposed to it's not that father also it's not, it should not be there. But there is high chances that one more, the more common is the root of exposure is the, this one only, blood transfusion rather than pregnancy. What about a woman, if a mother, if the, many yeah, multi parous woman has high chances of the DSA rather than single. So you prefer to the father there? Yeah. So in general, the multi, more the parasite, the more the DSA and chances of rejection also. So this is about the DSA. So these are the different methods of the DSA identification. That is single uh, antigen bead assay. I was telling close cytometric cross method and CDC cross method. The most of the time we do the single bead antigen assays of and uh, again is the HLA antigen. So they will class, they will uh, multiplex detection of the antibodies in more than hundred HLAs class one and class two simultaneously. It will be done. Whereas sometimes flow cytometric also can be done and. Uh, CDC cross matching also they can do, but usually the most commonly followed and most sensitive is the single bead antigen assay. BSA. Yes, we are doing that one. BSA. But we are we are not doing here, we are outsourcing and getting done. Yeah. So then coming to the just desensitization, if you have if you don't have any option of the uh, DSA negative haplos, we have to take one of them. So these are the different, so that is mainly. The antibody, the desensitization, what we are doing is the, the we are removing the antibodies against those HLS from the patient. So this is the antibody removal. So different methods are there. We can do plasma pheresis where the antibodies can be removed, immunoabsorption or give uh, IVIG. So that is new. The one is the antibody removal. That is plasma pheresis and immunoabsorption. And the whatever the antibody is there, you neutralize. That is clearance of anti-HLA antibodies. That is through IVIG you can give or donor type of platelets or buffy coat infusion if you do, those will neutralize the anti-HLA antibodies. One more is inhibition of the antibody production. So that is mainly rituximab if you give, you can give also give the proteosome inhibition that bortezomib. So what we are following is a combination of uh, this and uh, this IVIG. So we, we are using the both bortezomib, rituximab and sometimes IVIG also. This uh, we are using for the desensitization.
so these are the common methods for the desensitization if you don't have any option for the dsa negative haplos so we can do we have to do desensitization then we have to um, uh, resend the dsa whether the our desensitization uh, was effective whether the dsa levels have come down if the dsa level has come down then we have to take for the transplant sometimes even after desensitization if the, it is not drastically reduced then if the transplant is really needed with the high risk we have to take for the transplant there is more chances that they might have graft failure or poor graft function also yeah, question. How, because you know for the IDIG, very expensive and it looks about how often do you get DSA, the DSA issue yeah that's what uh, around 20 to 25% dsa issues but the, that's what if you have multiple donors if you have one donor with the dsa another one with the uh, dsa negative then we take the dsa negative don't consider about these these the rare cases where that less than 10% where both the two or three haplo donors who have all are dsa positive then we have to under there is no other option we have to go for desensitization procedures donor negative donor antibodies against donor. If you give that one, it, these antibodies will fight against them. So there is clearance of the antibodies. Same like our, I will be telling about the major ABO mismatch. We are donor type of blood we are giving to new, reduce the antibodies. Similar mechanism here also. But, uh, uh, no, they are no, no. These are uh, against donors' antibodies. These antibodies levels will be reduced uh, in the patient because to fight against this one, they will. Oh, it is, it is, uh, similar. Ah, similar. So they will reduce the clear the HLA uh, donor type of antibodies from the patient. So that is. These are the methods. So this was about briefly about HLA. So I have not because in HLA, if you go into deeply again in the unrelated, I have not spoken about the unrelated settings because in unrelated settings, there is something called Kir typing and Nima mismatch. All those who are Nipa mismatch will be there. So those are very out of context of the hours because we are using mainly the matched and haplos. So this much of the basic how to, what to do, what is the procedures and uh, uh, what is the in haplo context what is the directions gvh and hvg direction and dsa this is a simple basic uh, hla cytoid so this is the one of the nice paper uh, howard et al they had recommended in the uh, ebmt so their blood and bone marrow transplant trials network they had given the consensus guidelines for the recommendation for the donor hla assessment and matching for the allogenic stem cell transplantation but this was published in uh, uh, 2011. So after that also many significant developments have come, but still this plays a very important role. So this, they, they had recommended that for related donor marrow stem cell transplant, that is fully HLA matched sibling. If you have the first choice, optimal first choice, uh, you, should, you should consider as a always match sibling first choice. So in that the recipient sibling or if in case if you don't have sibling or parents whenever available should be type diagnosed HLA B intermediate or high resolution and DRB1 with the high resolution. This is the minimum requirement. I was saying that time I was showing minimum requirement. You should have A, B and DRB1. If you have chance to see for other loci, that is C and DQB1 also, ideally it should be done. If you don't have chance to see that, but minimum should be in HLA mass sibling, these three should be there. A, B and DRB1 should be type data high resolution by DNA methods. The additional also, if may be considered in the C and DQB1 also. The at least six by six, again, uh, the, the recipient and selected sibling donor should be at least six by six match at the A, B and DRB1. So this is the one of the guidelines they are told. If the in if you are going for HLA mismatched relative, that is one of the haploidentical related donor, there is something called one antigen mismatched related donor. So usually what happens is there are some uh, minimum is six by six matches there. If you have chance to type for eight or nine, so there is eight or ten. So there, there is some consideration that seven by eight or nine by eight also can be considered as a fully matched. We can take as a single antigen mismatch donor. So that is, they should be A, B and C should be typed that intermediate or high resolution HLA and DRB1 should be based on DNA method. So if you have only eight, then A, B, C, the, uh, in addition to that A, B and DRB1, you should include uh, C also, even if, uh, no one has full match we can consider as seven by eight match also we should we can consider in the one antigen mismatch related donor 
and if you coming to the HLA haploid identical related donor, so we should type for HLA A, B, C and DRB1 and if you available now we have a DQB1 also, all this should be typed and see for the whether haploid identical is there or not and uh, there is significant graft failure exists in the HLA mismatch related uh, transplantation in the sensitized patient that is those with the uh, DSA positive. So, they should be screened all the according to guidelines all haplo should be screened for the presence of the antibodies that is donor uh, against the donors carrying hla target and they should be avoided so that is dsa is must whenever you are considering for the haplo the, you have to do dsa then coming to the unrelated donor so as i was telling so you, if you have a adult donor unrelated so we have to at least evaluate for eight matches according to the guidelines at least for eight matches that is a b c and drb1 you have to match that is sometimes we might have consider for seven by eight also but there is significant risk of the transplant related mortality in the unrelated even with the seven by eight compared to the matched related in match related seven by eight is also acceptable if you don't have any eight by eight but in unrelated, there is significant difference between the transplant related mortality between the 8 by 8 and 7 by 8 also. So, if you have a multiple, if you have done 8 by 8, you have multiple unrelated matches are there. There comes the mainly the DPV1 DQ. That's why the now because of the registries, initially there were not much unrelated registries were there. Now, the, as the transplant programs have evolved, there is much unregistries uh, are there. More people are uh, uh, volunteering for the bone marrow donation, all those. So, more we have the HLS, all those. So, then they came the, that even with the 8 by 8, multiple matches might be there. So, among them, whom to choose better? Then they came the role of the, the extended type, that is DPB1, DQB1, all these we have to type additional HLA loci. Those who have match with the these also, we have to take them as a donor rather than only 8 by 8. If they have mismatch at DPB1, DQB1, we have to avoid them and those with uh, DPB1, DQB1 matches, we have to take. So, if you have uh, unrelated donors, multiple donors, usually they will prefer younger unrelated donor because you know that the older the donor, more the chances of chronic GVHD. So, the younger donor are found to be associated with the less chronic GVHD and better overall survival. If you have, uh, then you comes the ABO compatible, if you, I will be speaking about ABO incompatibility later. So, ABO compatible donors, which are also associated with the better survival. So, you, this is mainly comes if you have multiple donors with the fully match, then you have to consider age all those. That is, these are the uh, algorithm for the donor selection. First comes the HLA, then you do CMV reactivity, blood group, age, all those we have to consider. There is donor selection that will be separate class, that will be the guideline. So, in uh, I am not going detail about the umbilical card. So, some centers still they do the umbilical card blood transplant. So, usually the umbilical cards are the less immunogenic. So, we know that the, uh, the, the immunogenicity is because the, the T cell function is will be naive in the umbilical cards. So, there is less immunogenic. So, usually that's why they should be minimally typed at the same like uh, our uh, fully match. A, B and DRB1, they should be typed minimally. So, even they say that 5 by you can consider 5 by 6 also in the umbilical card matches because of the less immunogenicity. So, they might not hamper our transplant outcome. So, you can more than that is 4 by 6 can be considered in the umbilical card. So, if uh, consideration of the high resolution matching at the A, B, C, D, R, B, one to maximize the graft success and minimize the risk of non-transplant related mortality. That's what is important. It's not that if you have chance to do the high resolution and more typing, it's better always to type for the more. So that is 8 by 8 or 10 by 10. Because sometimes if you consider as a 6 by 6, they, not, they might not be fully matched. They might have uh, mismatch at the DQB1 or DPB1. So that also will hamper the graft success also. So always the, the take, out, take home point is always if you have high resolution can type for the all minimum 10 by 10. That is uh, uh, ABC and DR and DQB1. We have to type and select the donors. If you don't have these guidelines we can follow. Mini these are the minimum criteria. So this is the just what I told. They have summarized in the table what for the match sibling, what you have to do. One antigen mismatched, haplo, unrelated uh, 8 by 8, 7 by 8, and umbilical card, what minimum has to be. These are the guidelines in the EBMT. So this is about the brief about the HLA. So the importance of the HLA in the HSCT setting. So quickly I will go into the ABO. So I will not go into detail about ABO. So, 
we know that unlike uh, in uh, solid organ transplants hematopoietic stem cell transplant transplants can be uh, can be done across the abo barrier so whereas in solid organ transplant we you know that the abo matching is very important whereas in hsct use of abo blood group mismatch is acceptable in hsct so what happens is the hla and abo blood group are completely differently coded so the hla as i told the hla was in the chromosome 9 where the abo blood group antigens are the coded by the chromosome 9 so abo groups are inherited independently from the hla hence ABO incompatibility with the donor recipient is usually we observe in the 30 to 40 percent. So it is not a barrier for the HSCT ABO incompatibility. But we have some uh, uh, adverse effects with the ABO incompatibility also in the HSCT settings. So usually what happens? What are the main uh, uh, effects of the ABO incompatibilities? One is immediate or late hemolytic reactions can occur in the ABO incompatibility. One is pure red cell aplasia and delayed red cell recovery. And uh, sometimes uh, GVHD also can occur in the situation of the ABO. More chances of the GVHD can also occur in the ABO relation. So we know that all uh, the ABO anti antibodies are the IgM class of the antibodies. These are the carbohydrate type of the antibodies. So for example, if uh, the any A, B, and we have two groups. If anybody has antigen, antigen A. And if they don't have B, so we know that they will have uh, uh, the antibody against the non-existing. So that's why if any blood group A is there, antigen is A, though they will inherently have they will anti B antibodies. Similarly, B anti A antibodies, whereas the AB antigen doesn't have any antibodies, whereas O group will have anti A and anti B both will have. So that is the uh, these are the IgM. So in HSCT setting, we can encounter three types. That is one is major minor and we say bidirectional incompatibility so when we say major it occurs mainly by the anti donor isoagglutinins from in the patient body if the patient harbors anti donor type of the antibodies that is called major abo incompatibility so in minor the donor b lymphocytes will produce against the recipient antigens that is in bidirectional it can occur in the both for example so i will give you see this is the major and uh, minor so major is, for example, if the patient is O positive, so he harbors both anti A and anti B antibodies are there. So he has against the donor type of the uh, antibodies against donor type of antigen. So that is when the we have donor type of antibodies that is called major. Whereas in minor is the donor has antibodies against the recipient uh, antigens. So that is minor. Bidirectional is A and B. For example, if the patient is A and B. So the patient also has the antibodies against the donor and the donor also has the antibodies in this patient that is bidirectional. So that is the concept of the major and minor. So coming to the major, so it's all, uh, as we know that it is a presence of the naturally existing uh, host hemoagglutinins against the ABO antigen of the donor RBCs. The patient has anti-donor RB uh, antibodies against the donor. So usually these all uh, our uh, antibodies are IgM antibodies. So usually they pr produce robust active classical complement activate pathway if they activate. So usually they can cause acute hemolytic transfusion reactions at the time of stem cell infusion. So mainly that is significant when the graft contains significant volume of RBCs. We know that our stem cells doesn't have any blood group antigens. So that's the one of the advantage. So if, if the stem cells also had blood group antigens, then we should have no abo barrier only we have to select the with the within the group of the abo since we don't have uh, the stem cells doesn't have blood group antigens that's why we can transfuse stem cells without the blood group uh, barrier also the only thing is for example if you do unmanipulated bone marrow so this we are aspirating bone marrow usually we are doing in our match sibling settings most of our uh, uh, the blood product is the bone marrow source so that will have lot of significant volume of the rbcs so if you transfuse those the already preformed uh, antibodies in the patient will be there. Those will go and fight against the donors and it will cause significant hemolytic reactions. During that time, we might have loss of the stem cells also because of these uh, cytokine storm, all those hemolysis reactions will be there. There is the stem cell loss also can be there. So it can cause acute hemolytic transfusion reactions during the time of uh, infusion. What is the immediate reaction? Sometimes what happens is this can also lead to reticulocytopenia. That is, uh, along with these antibodies, because we know that 
our the donor stem cells will produce the donor type of the blood there in a host if antibodies are still existing the matured rbcs will these will go and fight against the reticulocytes if they kill reticulocytes they can cause pure red cell aplasia in the patient if you have major abo mismatch and transfused so usually the prca occurs 30 to 90 days post hsct usually they might become anemic and there, if you do bone marrow, there is absence of erythroid precursors in the otherwise normal bone marrow. Other cell, other cell lines will be normal. Only the uh, erythroid series will be less. So this is also one of the comp late complication of the major ABO mismatch. Yeah. Yeah. He has anti A and anti B. But now. Another, if there is chances, A, B, he has no antibodies. antibodies. That is minor. Oh, that's minor. That was I was telling. See, this, if the recipient phenotype, this was I was quoting. If the recipient phenotype is A, B. Ah, if the recipient is A, B. A, B. Yes. Then he, it will be minor only, always. Because he doesn't have antibodies. Whatever the antibody, if the donor is O. Donor is O. Naturally, he has antibodies. That will be also minor. Irrespective of the recipient, anti that's what, irrespective of your recipient, if donor is O, that is minor. Always it will be minor. If recipient is O, irrespective, other than O, irrespective of donor, it will be major. Donor. But anyways, there are two situations. There is one situation is when the recipient is black or O, yeah, bidirectional. I told. For example, if the recipient is A, yeah, or uh, you are telling the two situations. No, that for major, for major. Yeah, for major mismatch is the recipient is A or B. For example, if recipient is A, donor is AB. Uh, and the donor is AB. AB. So you have anti B. Recipient will have anti B against the donor. So that is also one of the situation where major. So whenever the recipient has antibodies against the donor that's why it's not about a b if the recipient has antibodies against the donor that is major yeah. if the donor has antibodies against recipient the recipient doesn't have any antibodies in the donor that is minor if both have that is bidirectional you also consider sorry no 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 D factor we will not consider. Only we will consider as a this AB only. We are not considering uh, RH factor. Okay. So this is the main one. The immediate is the uh, the effect of the major ABO mismatch. One is acute hemolytic transfusion reaction and delayed is reticulocytopenia. So usually what happens is the, that's why to prevent. Uh, I will tell the guidelines also. So usually the uh, the majority of the recipients will clear donor specific hemagglutinin within 120 days. So the development of the PRCA is attributed to if still the some of the recipient plasma cells are there, they produce the isohemoglobin against the donor type of blood, they might develop because many patients of the ABO mismatch are delayed. Uh, the fall in the hemoglobin we will see in the post-transplant follow-up, maybe like three months, four months. So you, they might develop because what happens is the some of the patients' uh, anti plasma cells might be surviving, they might develop antibodies continue to produce antibodies against the donor type. As the engraftment occurs, the body will produce donor type of blood only. So these antibodies will fight against donor donor type. Then they can cause some uh, depletion of the RBCs. They can cause pure red cell aplasia also. So there are some rare, uh, ABO antigens are also expressed on the granulocytes and platelets. So sometimes they can cause ABO. Major mismatch can also lead to prolonged neutropenia and thrombocytopenia also. So, okay. Okay, so whether the ABO mismatch is can affect HSCT outcomes such as survival, relapse, GVHD is still controversial because many studies they say that because of this ABO mismatch and because of this prolonged neutropenia, sometimes acute hemolytic reactions, the stem cell loss might be there. There might be some gra poor graft function, GVHD also because of the, we know that the G one of the trigger for the GVHD is one of the damage to the tissues. When hemolytic reactions occur, the more damage to the tissues, the more chances of GVHD. But some papers say that there is no relation between the survival GVHD and the ABO mismatch. So that's why still the HSCTs can be con conducted across the ABO barrier if you don't have suitable donor also. 
So in usually what happens is that's why when, whenever the ABO major ABO mismatch donor and recipient are there, we will do titers anti agglutinin titers from the recipient. So the general consensus that if the titer is less than one is to thirty two, there is less chances of the hemolytic reactions. They will tolerate the transfusion well. So if that less than one is to thirty two, more than one is to sixty four is there, then there is more chances that the hemolytic transfusion reactions will occur. So for that, what we will do is there are uh, how to prevent. I, so this this is the preventive strategies. For example, if you have done the uh, titers, uh, the titers are very high. Then there are some preventive strategies for the complications. That is, one is we know that these antibodies will fight against the uh, RBCs of the graft. That is only main bone marrow. For example, if you are doing PBSC, the only most of the cells will be uh, stem cells only and lymphocytes. There is no RBCs. So the, fi the fighting will not occur. So the major ABO mismatch during transfusion, th there is nothing uh, harm to the graft also. Whereas if the bone marrow has large uh, volume of the blood, so the hemolytic reactions will occur. So if the titers are very high, one of the strategies is the graft RBC reduction. So the RBC reduction from the graft we have to do. So to and remove all of the isohemoglobin by the plasma exchange before SCT. That uh, either you have to remove antibodies from the patient or you have to remove the RBCs from the donor. The easy procedure is one of the procedures you can remove RBC depletion can be done thrown through the machine. You can remove the RBC depletion. One of the disadvantages during RBC depletion, we may have stem cell loss also. Many studies, they have told that the, the RBT depletion will do. There is 30 to 40 percent chances of the losing of the stem cells also. So that is there. Then pre-transplant immunoabsorption. So this is the one of the type we are uh, following where either you can infuse the donor type of FFP or we can infuse the donor small donor type of the RBC donor type of RBC transfusion. So where it is one of the immunoabsorption method where these small will go and fight against those antibodies and neutralize those antibodies that the, it will significantly uh, bring down the the antibody titers. So these are the two methods we can do immunoabsorption method. Either we can transfuse the donor type FFP or donor type of the RBC transfusion. So in our unit protocol, what we are doing is. For any ABO mismatch, if you are using a bone marrow as a stem cell source, during admission, we will do uh, IHA titers in the patient against donor. If any titer less than 1 is to 64, that is 1 is to 32, less than that is there, there is no harm. We are not doing anything. So we know that the hemolytic reactions are less. So we are transfusing. For example, today's transplant, if you take into consideration Kalpit, he was also major ABO mismatch. So we had done, so his titers were 1 is to 32. So that's why we didn't do any manipulation. We have given stem cells. If they need titers, we have encountered many patients whose titers were more than 164. Then in during the busulfan day, that is a busulfan days, four days, small alicard. So we will start from the 10 ml, 5 ml, 10 ml like that. Four to five days we will give uh, escalated doses, 5 ml, 10 ml, 20 ml if they are tolerating. So until the consensus that we have made that if they tolerate 50 ml of the donor type of the blood, there is less chances of the hemolytic reactions during the uh, harvest transfusion. So escalated dose of the donor type of the RBC transfusions we are giving so that it will desensitize the immunoabsorption method. So this is a simple method. So the is that uh, assuming maybe the donor the recipient is old. Yeah. Uh, maybe the donor is free. Uh, I'm now giving the recipient B is B B is B B type. So what is the molecular mechanism there? Like the antibody, antibody? Yeah, this the patient has already anti B antibodies, you know. Yes. So you are giving donor type of blood from the small volume because you are not giving big volume that my hemolytic, you know that hemolytic reactions will occur. Yes. So you small volume will give, so it will cause reactions. Yes. The antibody content will come down. So then gradually you increase. First day you give 10 ml, next day you give 20 ml. So gradually escalate. If you give more volume, more the reaction and the more the uh, acute hemolytic reactions might occur. It might damage our kidney all those. Graded, graded you give. So if you if they tolerate around 50 ml of the donor type of it, there is the, uh, the, the antibody titers will be very less. There is chances that they will have any, don't have any significant reactions during the bone marrow transfusion. You basically want to consume those antibodies. antibodies. Yes. The mechanism, the same. Immuno absorption from, that is antibody consumption you are doing. That is the mechanism. And uh, in minor, so you know that that minor means the donor has uh, antibodies against the platelet uh, patients, uh, recipients, uh, antigens. So that is minor mismatch. So usually 
they can also cause acute hemolysis of the recipient rbcs sometimes there is some something called passenger b lymphocytes for example what happens is if during pbsc or in stem cell transplants we know that the antibodies are produced by the b lymphocytes when the mature b lymphocytes they convert into plasma cells they will produce antibodies so in minor abo mismatch what happens is when you are transfusing from the patient to the donor to the patient along with the stem cells that we might transfuse b lymphocytes also in pbsc also if you minor transfusion b lymphocytes can go these b lymphocytes in the patient if can develop into the uh, plasma cells they can produce antibodies so we know that these antibodies are producing against the patient's uh, blood group so they can cause hemolytic reactions also this will not be significant hemolytic reaction this will be minor so usually passenger lymphocyte typ typically occurs one to two weeks post ssct because these lymphocytes need time to mature there so they will go inside the patient the donor type of lymphocytes will go and mature there they will produce antibodies they will cause hemolysis in the patient so usually more frequently after peripheral blood rather than bone marrow because we are transfusing more lymphocytes through the pbsc so that is called some terminology called passenger lymphocyte syndrome in the minor abo mismatch so they can cause significant hemolysis so it can manifest usually one to two weeks after the transplant where there is significant drop in the hb so this might be the one of the reason passenger lymphocyte lymphocyte syndrome so preventive strategies is one we can uh, one we can do is the graft plasma volume reduction because we know that the antibodies the donors antibodies are causing the reaction then we can reduce the plasma from the donor that is one and the most of the time what we are doing in our unit is so for all minor mismatches we are transfusing the o group of the o type of the transfusion to the patient so that the the usually three three months time we take because we know that the rbc survival is 120 days so prior three months for the donor if you start transfusing o type of the transfusion so they will have o means they will have antibodies in there only so usually the donors also if you give there is doesn't make any significant reactions so that is uh, one one is you can reduce the plasma from the graft or you can transfuse the o type of the blood transfusion to the patients at least 120 days prior so that the significant hemolytic reactions will not occur so that is uh, minor okay, okay so this is the just one uh, last slide i think so abo mismatch what happens in the major minor and this is a uh, passenger lymphocyte syndrome so in a major abo mismatch we know that the antibodies in the already in the recipient will be there it will cause damage to the donor cells so how when it will manifest usually the major abo mismatch the reactions will manifest from the day 1 day 0 only whereas in minor i told 1 to 4 one, first week to second week and in the uh, pls that is passenger lymphocyte syndrome the where they it can cause pure red cell aplasia it is usually produces after 1 to 3 months the treatment mainly that supportive care only transfusion of the so in major uh, the recipient compatible red cell units you have to transfuse and donor uh, allocates hmm? and uh, uh, in uh, minor also supportive care and transfuse donor compatible rbcs and rbc exchange we can do and uh, this uh, mainly if in prca the main treatment is either you can give rituximab we can reduce to the antibodies and uh, dlis we can give or bortezomib we can use or we can use ivig also these are all reduce the antibodies because mainly prca we know that is mainly due to antibodies acting against the reticulocytes so those antibodies we have to kill this is the main mechanism so this is the recommended transfusion support for example if you have any major or minor mismatch in the unit if recipient according to the recipient and donor which is the first choice to transfuse for example if the recipient is o donor is a so you know that it is a major abo mismatch always in the during the transplantation time you have to give o positive groups of the uh, rbcs and granulocyte components whereas platelet and plasma you can give either a and ab also it's stable is there it's available everywhere i can share you this also this is the guidelines where which is the first product and second product we have to transfuse during the uh, abo incompatibility so i think this is the brief i think if you have any doubts i think i didn't go into detail about the abo procedures all those whatever we are following guidelines that only i have told so because the long term complications in the hsct poor that also one of the topic in the ABO, this is during transplantation i have told so even abo major and minor they will have long term like a pure red cell aplasia and hemolysis 
acute uh, uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia all these also abo matches will play a role so that is entirely the post transplant complications we can consider there how these abo incompatibility all those matter so this is brief about the abo incompatibility in the hs yeah yeah 